Hello and welcome once again to Crazy Comics and Stories. It's me, your charming and delightful old Uncle Rap Bastard. And at the other end of the series of tubes and wires that we call the internets is Joe, Crazy Writer. How you doing today, Joe? I, I want it now. Now. I don't want to yeah. wait till January. You're going to have to wait. We're coming because... to the party. We're recording this the day after. Well, tell, tell them who broke the story, Corey. Well, it was the Uncanny Omar, who I interviewed in Solitaire Rose Radio number 80. Yay. And if you haven't listened to it yet, yeah, you need to listen to it because Omar is a really interesting dude. But he's the guy who on YouTube is kind of the official person who announces Marvel's omnibuses. And really, they listen to him in that... He will point out things like, okay, you may have the mapping on this wrong. These are the ones that people are asking for. Every year he does a poll to see the top 20 omnibuses people want reprinted. And he sends it on to Marvel. And last year they reprinted 19 of the 20. And of course, it's something. Well, yeah, go ahead. I'm already already, already at the end of the show because I'm so gaming for the news. Because Corey sent me the omar's youtube thing and well we'll get to why i didn't watch it immediately yeah but it's funny how i sent you this and i said you need to watch this and you need to watch it now and i did and and you said a couple of jokes and then said a couple things and then you know then you were like i forget what you said let me but it was you haven't watched it yet yeah, you were like, oh, I don't feel good today. No, I didn't say I didn't that. I, I was in the middle of a fucking root canal, okay? But. I'm going to pull it up here because. When I got home. There it was. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I was, assume that you sent this and you're not trying to fish my personal information. Yeah, that was the first thing. Then, then I said. said then you the first thing when you get something, it's like, you, you got to watch this. And I'm like, oh, shit, Corey's Facebook has been con- or, uh, hacked. But then I thought, you're really good with passwords and shit. You know, I mean, Solitaire Rose dot, you know, is great. Oh, shit. I just gave out your passcode. Okay, whatever. Then you sent a sad picture. Yeah. And it's like, oh, you that can't be me. sad about this. That was me in the dentist's office. But you didn't say that. Well, I kind of figured when you saw the dental shit behind me that it might, oh, fuck, writers up again. <sighs> but. That's all in that's all in freaking because we'll we'll talk about that. But yeah, once I watched, once I once I saw it, then go ahead and tell him what I wrote. O M G! I need a cigarette. (laughs) (laughs) I don't even smoke. (laughs) So yes, Rom is coming back at Marvel for an omnibus. Uh, volume one, which means that if it sells well, there will be a volume two and a volume three. Because the way they the, the question is, did they, you know, because we've been bitching about that for years. I mean, I know Omar will probably, you know, had a lot to do with it. But again, just one of those things we mentioned years ago on our podcast. We actually mentioned a few weeks ago. Oh, yeah, we keep because I it said, up. you know, they could license it, and you were like, ah, no, Disney wouldn't do that. Hey, but Marvel might. Marvel wanted to prove you wrong. Well, I'm all for that. So they will be, the first omnibus is ROM number one through 29, and the crossover with Power Man Iron Fist number 73, which, which if you go to your Power never, Man Iron Fist. Yeah. Never been reprinted. Even in their epic collections or the, uh, I don't know if they the got that far in the essentials. Yep, they got all the way to the end in the essentials. It's not in the essentials. There will also be a ROM facsimile edition number one. Now, here's the thing. People on Wikipedia have changed it to, and Marvel will be doing new ROM comics. Nowhere in the announcement does it say that. Yeah, I would love that because I think it would be fun to have him back. But if it is going to happen... They haven't announced it. That would be that would be a second reason I would put. Well, let's just say I will. I would probably take off my pants before Corey sends me another video. <laughs> very, so, very embarrassed at the dentist. So the 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 thing about that is, 
this, when I read over the press release and think about Marvel's history and such, it reminds me a lot of when they did the John Carter Warlord of Mars omnibus or when they did the Godzilla uh, Essential. Mm -hmm. It looks like, from what they're saying, they just have the license to reprint ROM. The license to create new stuff would be a different license, and they would have they would have announced that separately. So we should try to. I'm going to put ROM in context historically, and then you can talk about the series. But what it well, was we, before we get too far into it. I got to delve into something you probably don't play a lot with, and I'm talking mostly about the toy. Because ROM was a toy co-created, and it, I'm just reading Wikipedia because a lot of this I wasn't aware of. Because when ROM comic came out, the toy had already pretty much tanked because it was yep. co-created by Scott Dankman, Richard C. Levy, Brian L. McCoy, according to U.S. Patent 4,267,551. Sold to Parker Brothers, and then that in, was the inspiration for the comic book. The toy was originally named COBOL after the programming language, but was later changed to ROM after read-only memory by Parker Brothers executives. The toy set a precedent in the gaming publishing company, which up to that time had only ever produced board games. This was a new venue for the company, given that electronic toys were still very new. Now, for you... Young kids in your fancy smartphones and you can play movie s type games. We're talking this was back when anything that beeped with an LED was cool. And that's pretty much what Parker Brothers did is they decided to make this electronic toy as cheap as possible. The product had few points of articulation just had twin LEDs that served as Rom's eyes because they they were going to do green, but they were expensive to produce. Rom actually appeared in the corner box of Time magazine in 1979 because it was featured as part of an article called Those Beeping Thinking Toys. And they also decried Rom's lack of articulation, predicted it would end up among the dust balls under the playroom sofa. And they were pretty much right. Of course, nowadays, here we are in 2023, and had you kept that ROM toy in the box or even loose, we're talking major, major money. I had one actually, and I must have bought it for 50 bucks, was like loads of money at the time. And what I ended up doing is I know our well, we haven't had him up, been able to corner him for the show, but uh, we've talked to him about him before. Brent Moore, who owned a shop called Comic Archives. Well, this was long after our shops were gone. But he had mentioned online that one of his holy grails was to actually get a ROM Space Knight toy. But they were two, three, four hundred dollars $400, 700 or more, if you could find one sealed. I got a hold of his wife. And I said, hey, I know he really wants this. I will sell this to you close to what I bought it for, 100 bucks." And she was ecstatic. And the day of Christmas, I got an email from him. Oh, my God, thank you so much. How did, where did you find <laughs> oh, I, I, I love doing that. Rom, I'm reading this, and I did this is something I didn't know. Rom was licensed to pet a toy in the United Kingdom to extend the space adventure line of Action Man and appeared in their 1980 catalog, but that toy failed and only sold 200,000, 300,000 units in the US with creator McCoy blaming the failure on poor packaging and marketing. Parker Brothers abandoned the line and the toy is now infamous. You can go out and like I said, check on the Ebays. Even the pieces go for silly money. A new ROM action figure was released in 2017 for the San Diego Comic-Con at HasbroToyShop.com in limited quantities as part of the IDW Revolution set. If you remember, that was the whole thing where G.I. Joe, Transformers, Visionaries, GoBots, ROM, Action Man, whatever, they were all part of a 
shared universe and IDW had to come out. They had a set that was released that had Jetfire in it, Roadblock, Action Man, Latonic, characters from Micronach, a Dire Wraith, and Matt Tracker, as long as well with the ROM. And I actually have the box set. If I ever sell it, I'm keeping the ROM thing. And the ROM, I think, was given away as a promotional thing as well. Silly, silly money if you can find them on the eBay. So there is not a lot of ROM out there unless you get someone to make one. You would think, considering how much beloved the character is, that somebody would do a replica one. That said, the Marvel comic, which started in 1979, lasted till 1986. It was given license to Marvel Comics to build interest in the toy line. And Marvel expanded it on the premise that Rom was a cyborg and provided the character with an origin, a personality, established a character firmly grounded in the Marvel Universe, as they had done with Micronauts and Shogun Warrior, and had regular encounters with mainstream heroes and villains. Ironically, as we know, the title outlasted the toy. It was created to support with 75 issues, four annuals. I know of at least two out of ROM appearances, the aforementioned Power Man, Iron Fist, and I believe, wasn't there a two-in-one with Thing yes. and ROM? Yes, uh, Marvel two-in-one, number 99. There was also a X-Men appearance in X-Men 187. Oh, yeah, and he was on the cover of Avengers where they were like who's the new Avengers and Rom was in the corner and so. the reason that he showed up in the X-Men is because they were wrapping up the Dire Wraith storyline and Chris Claremont said well the Dire Wraith seem a lot like the Brood mm -hmm. and the Skrulls so maybe there's a connection and of course the the uh he had he had three tools he had the analyzer he had a translator, which he held with both hands. He didn't really use much outside the first couple issues. And then, of course, what did he call? What was his gun called? The ne neutralizer or neuralizer. Or he he could kill, but for most of the time, he sent Dire Race to Limbo, which, again, considering Marvel's Limbo has real interesting things if they ever decided to bring Rom back. In Earth X, Alex Ross. Kind of, was it was it did he hint that it was was it Captain America with the neutralizer or did he kind of say yeah this is where Rom is he's now in limbo fighting dire yeah race. they said that he's in limbo fighting dire race now oh, the the reason oh. why his gun would send dire race to limbo Jim Shooter's heroes do not kill although towards the end when Jim Shooter was no longer editor in chief uh -huh. He, Rom said, no, I am now, I think it was about the same time we actually saw Dire Wraith. Uh, now, Corey, I, I'm just going to mention quick because we IDW did publish Rom from 2016 to 2020. Total separate thing. Part of the whole uh, Hasbro comic universe thing that lasted and collapsed about 2018 as well. So and Merch and I tried so hard to read oh. that book. Because it came I, out on Free Comic Book Day, yep, and while well, you I'm were digging in boxes at Hot Comics, what was that? Hot Comics West, I think they were called at the time, or yeah, it was Hot Comics West. We sat and we tried to read it, and we couldn't make heads or tails out of what the hell was going on. Yeah, and I was excited for the whole Hasbro universe because I remember reading just a little tiny one blurb where they they talked about GI Joe. In the 70s, where they were doing the action line. Yeah. It, and I was excited about that because there was Mike Power, the Atomic Man, the only G.I. Joe I ever owned. Never, never saw Rom on the toy, in the toys, you know, and I went, again, to toy shops all over the Twin Cities. And again, I, I was a kid, so it wasn't like I was going to drop money on the thing. And looking at it, I probably wouldn't have bought it anyways, because considering the way the toys were, around 79 you know again i grew up with 12 inch gi joes big jim 
six million dollar man and then star wars had shrunk everything down and that's way people were going they thought everybody thought that was real cool now i want to talk a little about what was going on at marvel yep jim shooter had taken over in 1977-78 and one of the things about him first off he knew that Roy Thomas had saved Marvel with the Star Wars license. Gave no credit to Roy for doing yeah. it, but resented it him for really it. It was really fun. <laughs> when, I, when I read the facsimile edition, because I don't have my original, it came out two months before Star Wars hit. Yeah. Which was amazing, which accounts for a lot of the discrepancies between that and what we saw in the movie. Namely, Darth Vader floating a coffee cup into his hand that I still get a kick out of. But anyways... So they decided that licensed books, especially with Western slash Gold Key going away, were going to be a big money maker after Star Wars. But also, Jim Shooter was very big on kids' comics. He wanted kids' comics, and he wanted Marvel's books to quit being for college age and above. And if you read comics, it's really fascinating if you read the essentials or epics around that top line, where the stories go from being complicated and everything to all of a sudden it's, okay, it's one or two part stories. The vocabulary comes down. The complexity of the plots come down. Very, like, boom. It's all, you, you can almost see how it happens but he wanted more he thought that marvel would pick up the kids market and when harvey went away marvel tried to buy harvey that sale didn't go through but one of the things he did after the micronauts were such a huge hit was went to toy makers and said hey we would like to create toys based on your comics rom was one of those now it took so long for the development because remember, this was back before the days when you have, you know, you can email your pages in, et cetera, et cetera. The lead time was much longer. So when they got the license, ROM hadn't come out yet. But by the time the comic came out, the toy had already flopped. Because now the, the Wikipedia thing says that it's because of the packaging. I think it's because Parker Brothers had no idea how to market a toy. They were a game company. And those are two vastly different things. Because I remember at the time, there were no ads. Uh, from everything I read, it just kind of showed up in toy stores. There were no other figures for it. When I, I was around the age, I had gotten a little too old for toys. But a few years before the Micronauts, it's, oh, the Micronauts have this whole world. And then the Marvel comic came out. And I was a little irritated at the Marvel comic because, well, the world they have in the comic doesn't match up with what the toys are explaining. And as a sidebar, I remember I never saw Rom in the Sears catalog. Yeah. I saw Shogun Warriors. I saw, I saw Micronauts. So, yeah, it wasn't even... On the toy buyer's radar. Yeah. So it came out and sold very well because Bill Mantlo used tons of other Marvel characters. Sal Buscema, who at the time the hardcore fans were like, were, would roll their eyes, but Sal Buscema was one of those guys who, if you put him on a book, the book would sell. There's a reason why he was on Hulk for years and years and years and years. Then when he left Hulk, it was almost canceled. There's a reason why he was on Marvel Team Up for years and years and years. And him on ROM, you had him and Bill Mantlo, and they would have other Marvel characters on the cover, including, uh, was it issue 25, Galactus? Yeah, because they tried to trick Galactus into eating the Dire Race homeworld. Yeah. Which works so, about as well as Galactus seeing the planet pop up. So it was very integrated into the Marvel Universe, much like the Micronauts were, much like Shogun Warriors were, much like Conan was, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. $975 I could borrow, do you? 
not on me, no. Oh, because there's a ROM Space Knight that's mint in the box on eBay right now I could buy, but no, that's okay. And the reason it lasted so long is because sales were so good. When Sema left, I have Steve Ditko took over the book. And one of the things about ROM by Steve Ditko, Ditko liked it because ROM was a very black and white character. But that became where everybody who ever dreamed of working with Steve Ditko got to. You've got Pete Craig Russell, you've got Aiken and Garvey, you've got Brett Blevins, you have all these fantastic artists inking Ditko on ROM. And it lasted till issue 75. They knew the sales were going down to the point where, you know, if we got to pay Parker Brothers again, the book's not going to be making enough of a profit for us to waste any time on it. So Bill Mantlo had six months to wrap up the story. And then Rom just kind of went away. And nobody cared about it until the nostalgia bug. Now, they tried a couple of times to bring back the Space Knights. Well, and they did. could never mention Rom. Well, yeah, and they Rom did show up, though. Remember, there was a wedding he showed up for. Well, yeah, but that was that was not approved. No, but he was there. <laughs> he was there, but it was it's not so, approved. Yeah, he showed up, and I don't know the Hulk issue, but when uh, Rick Jones and was it Brandy at the time? I, I don't even yes. know if they're still married. Yep. They got married. It was a big event. I mean, even Death from the DC Universe visited so, but I think that was the actual last official, unofficial appearance of Rom. And they would just refer to him the greatest of us all. And he was never around. Not to say Marvel didn't use it, Space Knights. I think they used him most effectively in one of the Annihilation crossovers where Ultron took control of whatever. It's out there. Go read it. So if it sells, we'll get a second. And if that sells, we'll get a third. I would imagine, you know, we talk investment stuff. This is one of those omnibuses that may not get reprinted, much like the John Carter World Order Mars, which isn't worth a whole lot, and the Conan, which are already climbing in value. So there you go. There's your ROM story. Now, I recall, and I, I don't know if you recall this, but I recall seeing ads for Micronauts and Shogun Warriors before they came out because I was excited to do this. I think this was before I got in the habit of using Advanced Comics, so I was still much a fan. I don't recall ever seeing one for ROM except after it came out. Uh, I remember the ads. And one of those ads is actually going to be one of the covers. The uh, asteroid hitting Earth, fire, yeah. and then yeah. Rom stepping out of it. That was an ad that ran in Marvel Comics a couple of months, well, a month or two before Rom came out. Yeah, I don't. I, I did not pick oh. it up because it's like, I've never heard of this toy. The character looks goofy as hell. And it wasn't until I, I think. I forget when it was. Oh, I did not pick it up till the X-Men crossover in issues 17 and 18 and went, oh, this is pretty good. And the back issues were dirt cheap. So I was able to go and get all the back issues for like uh, only like 10, 15 cents above cover price. Yeah, and see, I jumped on board almost immediately because my story, as I said, I, I, I was a total Marvel zombie showing up at Schindler's one day and there was Rom number one fantastic fabulous first issue arrival and as I look at it I'm like I don't recall hearing about this I don't recall seeing it but it's a marvel and it's a number one now they were Parker Brothers was advertising the toy and there was a shot of the Rom comic from outer space to the pages of Marvel Comics, to your toy store comes the mighty champion of justice, truth, the greatest of all space night. Rom has come. Evil is on the run. And they kind of show his 
energy analyzer lights up bright red and makes strange electronic sounds beeping. And he had a little, I guess, fiber optic that would go from the back and plug into that so you could get the 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 actual thing to light up. And then, of course, he had his translator. It makes eerie electronic sounds, lights up. Imagine Rom has the ability to communicate with any intelligent being in the universe. And then, of course, Rom's weapon is... The neutralizer, it flashes, makes electronic zapping sounds. Pretend it sends evil creatures to the shadow zone. Rom Space Knight is a microelectronic toy from Parker Brothers. His rocket pods light up. His respirator makes realistic breathing noises. I didn't think so. And the three <laughs> action accessories show not only light, but make dramatic electronic sounds. Nine volt battery not included. You can pretend he has come from a galaxy far away to share heroic adventures with you. Rom is Parker Brothers trademark for its electronic sound and light effects toy action figures, 1979 Park. That was basically the full page ad that ran. I'm looking, I've actually got ROM number two, and I'm I I don't see there it is. ROM number two has the ad for ROM. And it's a pretty much the first page of ROM number one. However, ROM number one does not have that ad. So what I will I will contend they ran the ROM ads after ROM number one came out. And I don't know, Corey, you might remember the ads pretty much from book to book were the same. Yes. What yeah. it was, if you bought ads at Marvel, you bought for the entire line. Yeah. The only ones that would be different from book to book would be the house ads. So I will again, I'm I'm flipping through ROM number one. I, I look quickly at bulletin bullpens, and there's not a single mention of ROM, although they got a little blurb. Micronauts are on sale monthly. So what I recall as a kid is, I will say is true, they ran a ROM ad the month after ROM number one came out. Not that it would matter, as you said, because the back issue prices were cheap up until that X-Men crossover. Yeah. Those were expensive. <laughs> and that that actually got a lot of people to buy ROM. And if they'd have done it sooner. Now, Corey, do you remember why we never actually saw a physical form of the dire race? They were just kind of cloudy type beings. I don't remember why, but then when we did finally see them, they had been designed by Bill Sienkiewicz. They made that a big deal, and they were just kind of blobby things. <laughs> yeah, they were actual shapeshifters. They're actually more horrendous and horrifying because they were they were big, kind of purplish, reddish blobs. They had large tentacles, and they would actually drill into your head and take your form and identity. Whereas the other ones were just shapeshifters, and Rom's analyzer was able to detect which ones were dire race so when he shot the dire race what you and i would see was my god this thing just killed these people and that was one of rom's confusion up until he could finally talk with people why are these people so upset can't they see i just killed a dire wraith the reason why they never showed it and i believe this was actually in one of the letter pages Parker Brothers retained the license to design a dire wraith, which, as we already know, because the original ROM toy failed, that was never going to happen, which is why years later, and I've got the I've got the covers of ROM. I'm trying to see if I can spot which issue, but years later. They were able to. Marvel could design their own dire race. And then they actually did a pretty ingenious thing where they tied it into the the dire race were an offshoot of the scrolls, which is why when the scrolls showed up in ROM to oh there it is number 47 is where we first see the oh yeah it's it like aliens. I mean you see this thing with brutish type thing with teeth and as the tentacles come out there they both have large fangs in them so they tied it in they said that the dire rates were actually an offshoot of 
the Skrulls, and the Skrulls were hunting them down as much as Rom and the Space Knights were. There, that's your trivia. So, we got an email from Travis. It's Again? a question. Joe? Travis. Were speculating firms real during the 1980s black and white boom? I recall you talking about the black and white boom and bust several times over the 600 podcast, but I don't recall you mentioning the speculating firms. Ron France mentioned speculating firms when discussing some of the causes for overinflated hot books in the letters columns of what is the face in May 1987. <laughs> By the way, with all your extra free time, will you be writing a script for a documentary film that will be the definitive story of the black and white boom and bust? After the strike, of course. We don't want it to be a scab film. So but you can write all you want. You just don't going to get paid for it. <laughs> no, no, no. If you write and they uh, produce it, you are a scab. You are not uh, supposed to be writing because there's a lot of that talk among studios where, well, you know, they could be working on the scripts and you're not supposed to Isn't be working on scripts during a script during you're a strike. Writing for a movie or television? I mean if you're just writing to write an article or a book, does that affect you? No, that's uh I'm not in the screenwriters guild. Yeah, this is so only again, the screenwriters. Go, go ahead, guild. write write all you want. But I can't write a movie script. You can write any form you want, but you <laughs> might not be able to do what you anything with it. Right. Anyways. See how I there, feel things there were practice. there were speculation firms, but we know them by a different name. Comic distributors. Ooh. And I know this because I know of at least two distributors that did this. What it was right now, distribution is very, very different from what it was in the 80s. So I'm going to give a very brief history to get you all caught up. In the 70s, comics went to newsstands, and Phil Suling went to D.C. Phil Suling was a back-issue dealer. He went to D.C. and said, I would like to buy these directly from you. I don't want to have to go to a newsstand or et cetera, et cetera. I want to buy them from you with a hefty discount because I'm buying in bulk. And D.C. looked into it and said, well, you would have to buy at least this much and we don't want to deal with returns because returns were where people were getting screwed. I just read an interview with Neil Adams where he talked about how if his cover was on a DC book, it sold through the roof. But if he drew the interior, sales were terrible. And everybody at DC knew why, because the uh, books that he drew were kind of, quote, falling off the truck. People were going to the distributor and buying the entire bundle, and the distributor would just say, ah, returns. So we don't want to deal with returns. He said, fine. He then put together a deal with Marvel. And for a while, Seagate was the only distributor. Well, we needed distributors on the West Coast. We needed distributors on the Midwest, and we needed distributors here, there, and everywhere. And by the early 80s, there were a metric shit ton of comic distributors. I know that there were at least three in Illinois. One out of Chicago, one out of the Quad Cities, and one out of Sparta. And the only one of those that I remember the name of is uh, Greenwood, I think it was. But then in Wisconsin, you had Capital City. You had all these others. Heroes World. Yep, Heroes World was one. Lone Star, Buddy Sanders' uh, yep, yep. shop, had it, was also a distributor. Um, there was, oh God, Pacific Comics was a distributor before they became a publisher. Uh, there was Bud Plant out on the West Coast, which still exists, but they only sell like art, art books now. And the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, changed everything what it was it was these these two kids they put together a daredevil parody they borrowed money from their uncle 
so that they could print 3,000 copies. They put out a press release, which nobody had done, and it got picked up by the Associated Press and UPI. So there were it basically got free advertising in newspapers, and all 3,000 copies were sold before they were printed to different distributors. And it was immediately you know, a $10, $20, $30 book. So they took all the money they had from that and reprinted it and then printed issue two and reprinted that and so on and so on and so on. Now, the thing was, these distributors were selling at you know, 60% of cover price. And a lot of these distributors were just dudes. They weren't businesses as much as, okay, I'm setting up to distribute comics. Many of them were comic shops. So what they would okay. do. Let me jump in quick because this is actual. This could almost be a pre Tales from the Shop. Because Pat and I, back when we were just P&J Comics, we actually dealt with a guy. And I have no idea if he's still around. We used to call him the throat. He was a real thin guy with a huge Adam's apple. Real nice guy. But he was our contact for, air quote, hot comics. And I think the last of the books we bought from him, 20 copies, Penguin Samurai number one. And we were always questioning him. He was always cagey about where he got his stuff because this was like, at the time, one of the last hot books. And it's probably in your corner box, if even then, today. And he had a hundred of these things. And he would just, that's how he had his existence. He would bulk sell these things out. Pat bought more from him than I did because Pat was, at the time, single living with his parents so he had and he had a full-time job that actually paid full-time money so he was buying books like crazy and i was in college up to my what's it in debt and getting ready to get married so all my money was i, I was buying comics but not crazy but again he would be the guy to contact hey do you uh, do you have any fish police yeah yeah i got Hundreds of them. How many do you need? He must have been one of those guys, like you said, that would go and just buy these things and just wholesale them out to guys like Pat and I, whoever bought it. So it was just kind of like a trickle down effect. And we all know it imploded. So just a little sidebar, because when you said that about, about the way things were going, it kind of, I think you gave me the answer as to how he was able to score all these hot books at the right time when Pat and I needed them for the cons we would do. Probably so. Because really in the early days of the direct market, DC and Marvel would set, here's your minimum to buy direct from us. And comics were pretty cheap. So it wasn't hard to hit that minimum and that made it so many major cities had at least one distributor, sometimes two or three. You know, I know Chicago had one. I imagine they had more than one because I'm because I know that Cap City, uh, John Davis told a story about how they were distributing comics into Chicago and the mob firebombed their trucks until they had a sit down and said, we don't. We don't distribute magazines just comics we're not honing homing in on your territory we're not trying to you know which was pretty damn scary <laughs> but a lot of these would then oh this new black and white comics coming out this many have been ordered we're going to order five times that and then they would have a retail operation or they would take ads in the comic buyer's guide to sell these books before nat rat number one came out one of my favorite black and white books by mark uh oh i can't remember his name but it's anything any of the nat rat stuff is utterly hilarious beautifully drawn the artist the writer artist has since moved into animation where he makes insane amounts of money 
before it came out, it was already being advertised in the Comic Buyer's Guide for 10 times the cover price. Why? Because one of the distributors had, uh, well, we've ordered this many copies. We're going to have a whole bunch of them. We're going to have cases of them. And you also had all of these little bitty publishers because black and white printing by the mid 80s became really cheap, became super cheap to print black and white comics. So if you could put an ad out in the Comic Buyer's Guide and get orders for 20 to 40,000 copies. Mark, Mark. And, sorry. Yeah, just phoned him. <laughs> you, you know, hey, I could turn five thousand dollars into forty thousand dollars, and you had all of these people jumping into it. Well, by eighty six, eighty seven, something happened. People opened up those comics and saw that they all looked like shit. You go to a comic shop, dig in their quarter bin, find a Solson comic. It looks like crap. You and I, we talked about the Miami Mice comic. Looked like crap. People were like, well, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was well-drawn and funny. These are terrible. These look like somebody just drew it over their lunch period in math class or something. And then the people who had bought a case of gangrene jujitsu geriatric gerbils takes it to the comic shop. Yep. I want, want my $5 each for these. And the shop was like, well, I got a thousand of them over there because I bought a whole bunch of them. Nobody wants them anymore. And when something like that happens, the collapse is fast. Now, the 90s boom and bust, that collapse happened even faster because there was much more money involved. But all across the U.S., distributors went under. Boom. It was a, because they'd all been doing the speculation. There were comic shops in Illinois. I remember that for two, three months, they weren't able to get comics because their distributor went under. They were trying to, they went to another distributor, and that distributor went under. And then they'd go to another distributor, and he would say, okay, but I've already got people who've ordered the next two months worth of books. You're ordering three months in advance. You're not going to get comics for three months. And that caused shops to close down. There was a time when, when I left central Illinois. There were two shops in Peoria, a shop in Galesburg, a shop in Macomb, a guy outside of Canton, Illinois, a town of 2,000 people who was selling new comics. By the time I came back for Christmas in 88, they the, the shop in Macomb was the only one left. There was no shop in Peoria, Illinois. There was no shop in Galesburg. There was, you know, They'd all just boom. I don't know how many shops went under in the Quad Cities. And the number of shops that went out of business in Chicago was insane. Now, here in the Twin Cities, because Schinders was also, they didn't just sell comics. They also sold magazines and baseball cards and porn. Porn. Wow. There wasn't that big a collapse. But I do remember moving here and being told about, oh yeah, that shop just closed. Oh yeah, that just shop just closed. So that is what they meant by investment, investment houses. Let's see if there's any, oh, he also, he says, he sends another email saying that, uh, have you guys heard of or read this one? And he sends a picture coming soon from Ace Comics, the golden age of professional wrestling, featuring the fantastic art of Ross Andrew and Mike Epizito. Now, Ace Comics was a reprint company. Cover is for Mr. Universe, the world's wrestling champ. And it says that it's going to have, um, for the first time, special profile on the great former world champion, Danny Hodge. 
don't miss it. What this was, this was Ace Comics was basically a reprint house. Mr. Universe was a comic that Ross Andrew and Mike Esposito, who under their Mike Ross name, had published a whole bunch of comics. Much like uh, Simon and Kirby, they had had enough success in comics that they published their own stuff, and one of which was a wrestling comic called Mr. Universe, which had lasted a few issues. They announced that they were reprinting it, but due to the comic bust, never saw the reprint. Um, it, they licensed their stuff out a lot. A lot of the stuff in their mad knockoff, Get Lost, actually showed up at Marvel in the early 70s under one of the, you know, when they expanded, they had, um, they put out a couple of, they put out a little of everything. And I think one of them was called ARG that reprinted, oh, yeah. reprinted stuff from Get Lost. So, and Ross Andrew, you know, he worked at DC, came over, worked at Marvel, went back to DC as an editor. Uh, Mike Epizito was an inker at Marvel. Pretty much when he and Ross Andrew went to Marvel, he stayed at Marvel when Ross Andrew went back to DC because he was able to get tons of work inking stuff. And you'll see his name in comics all through the 70s and into the early 80s when he finally retired. So that is where Mr. Universe comes from. It, the reprint never came out. It is now public domain as far as we can tell because both uh, Ross Andrew and Mike Epizito have passed away. So their stuff is now currently in public domain and will eventually get reprinted by Guantana Land. Yay. And I think I'm looking through. Joe, you said you had an email. I do. Um through our Facebook page, I got an email from Donovan David, and he asked if we would give a shout out for a benefit comic convention, ArtCon, called Huracan. This will be Saturday, June 17th, and then farther in the year, November 18th, from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. at Bethany Congregational Church of East. He says, let me tell you a story. Hurricane Sandy hit my hometown of East Rockway, Long Island, New York, hard. Homes were flooded, trees were uprooted, boats were thrown up on the mainland, and many residents were forced from their homes and lost everything. The relief center after Hurricane Sandy was located at Bethany Congressional Congregational Church of East Rockaway in their gym for months. Neighbors affected by Hurricane Sandy came in, walked out with whatever they needed to get on with their lives. Hundreds of people came to the church following months, in the following months, and the gym floor took a beating. Gym floor has been re redone, looks great, but they still have to pay for it, and that is how the Huracan, a comic book art convention, was born. In addition to housing the Relief Center, Bethany has hosted Next Step Ministries at the church every summer since Hurricane Sandy. Next Step went into the surrounding community and performed repairs free of charge. Okay, but why support Bethany Church? Church has been part of the community since 1885. They run a thriftique, which is a thrift store. Oh, I love thrift stores. They sell clothing and household items at reduced prices, and many low-income families in the area come here to buy these items that they could not afford to go anywhere else. They also collect food for Long Island Council of Churches, Emergency Food Pantry in Freeport, and they make weekly contributions. What will you find at the June 17th Huracan? Comic books, of course, but comic book writers, artists, toys, food, raffles for unique items, collectibles, cosplays, fellowships, and much more. Local guest artist lists include Tom Travers, John Bergolia, and East Rockaway's old Kimball Thorpe. Hope you will consider supporting Huracan on June 17th and later on this year, November 18th. Thank you, Donovan, Don, David Donovan. His contact information is Huracan, that's H-U-R-R-I-C-O-N at yahoo.com. And let's see if he's got any links here. Nope. So just uh, check it out if you happen to be in the New York area. And... Uh, 
again, you got anything anywhere in the US you want us to blurb, let us know. We love to hear from you and we uh, will, we, we're kind of a worldwide community, this podcast. We, how many, have you tracked, Corey, how many places this, this here podcast goes? I know you said we had a pod in Germany for a while. Yeah, we still are being picked up by that podcast aggregator in Germany, which surprises me. Hopefully the people in Germany listen and understand English or it's, hey, 90 minutes of people with funny voices speaking American. Yay, I, yeah. We have about four. When I upload an episode after a month, it's had about 4,000 downloads. Now, are we anywhere near the big guys? No. Hell no. But for 4,000 downloads for a comic book podcast, when comics average around uh, 40,000 issues sold, I think we do okay. Hey. Uh, we are on Stitcher. We're on Spotify. We're on YouTube. If you want to listen to us and stare at a picture of our logo for the whole two hours, yeah. we're a, we got approval to be on Amazon. So we'll be on Amazon soon. Maybe they'll pay us. I Ooh. doubt it. Yeah. We get paid. We get paid by these guys, our sponsors. Believe it or not, kids, this here podcast has sponsors, and that sponsor since day one is DreamHost.com. DreamHost.com is the best bar none web host in the whole known universe. And if you need a website, head on over to DreamHost.com, put in code CRAZY, that's K-R-A-Y-Z, and get $20 off your first year. Now, if you would like to advertise here on any of the Solitary Rose Network podcasts, you can just email me at solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com, subject advertising. Also, head on over to eBay and look for user Crazy, K-R-A-Y-Z, that's Joe Crazy Writer, who's always telling us about the eBay in every episode of Crazy Comics and Stories. If you would like to contact us, you can do so. You can give us a call at... 952-856-0519, leave a message, and we'll play it on the show. Or you can send us an email at solitairerosenetwork at gmail.com. Thanks. And this isn't the only thing I do. I do all of this other stuff. The Solitaire Rose Radio Network is currently on a pause, basically because COVID-19 has made it so that uh, I have to work a lot of extra hours at both jobs, but you can still go and listen to my other podcasts. Now, you're probably listening to Crazy Comics and Stories, which is the main podcast, but on this same feed, K-R-A-Y-Z-C-O-M-I-X, is Solitaire Rose Radio, the solo radio podcast that I do. Um, I've done interviews, I've done short stories, I've done all sorts of things, and you can get to it right here on this same feed. I also do a podcast called Novelcast, where I take the novels I've written and turn them into free audiobooks. That's over at novels.solitairerose.com. Dangerous Dan Moore and I, and of course Wolfie B. Bad, give you bad advice over at badadvice.solitairerose.com. You send in your questions, and we give you the aforementioned bad advice. And then myself and Adam Vermillion from For the Love of Comics do the Fantastic Forecast at fantasticforecast.solitairerose.com where we go through the issues of the Fantastic Four, four issues at a time, to give the plot and commentary on each issue. That's not all. Yes, I'm crazy. I still over at pwinsiderelite.com every week on Wednesday do a recap of the latest episode of AEW Dynamite. I write up what happened, and then myself and Anthony Pyrus will do an audio. Now, you can only listen to the audio if you're a member at PWInsiderElite.com, and if you're a wrestling fan, you should be, where we then break down the episode, talk about what we liked, what we didn't like, give it a grade, and let you know if you should watch that episode. Those are the other podcasts here at the Solitaire Rose Radio Network. Thanks. On top of my two jobs. On top of that, uh, rumor has it Corey sleeps, but I have not had that confirmed. Not well. Yeah. And not nearly enough. But you know what I do do? 
I do 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 do. <laughs> you said do do. I read old comics, Joe. It's time for retro reviews. All right. Have you read an old comic lately? I have, and I dug into my collection and dug out my original copy of Rom Space Night number one. It was forty cents at the time. And Corey, why do you know why some UPC codes had like a black bar through them? Yes, those were the ones being sold in the direct market. Ah, because I bought this, like I said, at the Schinders downtown Minneapolis. So I've already talked to in the inside front cover is a fun factory, super gifts and gimmicks where you can get the catalog 1001 free things, which I did. And I went through about a third of it before I ran out of stamps. And I used to get all this free stuff in the mail. So it was a lot of fun. Pocket Spy Scope, Art Reproducer, Atomic Mini Pistol, Loudest Bang Ever, the 10 in 1 Scope. And these are good prices, a buck fifty for almost everything. Just you had to cut your coupon out and mail mail it in. So, of course, Stanley presents the greatest of the Space Knights, ROM. The comet appeared out of nowhere, catching the Earth's early warning system off guard. If it was a comet, ground-based radar tracked it, losing it finally in the lower altitudes over West Virginia. A seismograph registered its impact in the Allegheny Mountains. Tomorrow, somebody from the university will investigate if there is a tomorrow. By then, it may be too late. The crater glows white hot. The Earth itself has crystallized from the impact. But the armored giant emerges unscathed from the inferno. He is here. Arrival. And of course, all the little print underneath it. As you mentioned before, Bill Mantlo wrote it. Sal Bushima did the writing. All right, let's see. So Ron basically looks around as he's standing there. Okay, someone's coming at him. And it's, of course, we we will know her later as Brandy. Someone's standing in the road. Oh, my. She screeches and spins. The being loses control of the car. He senses that it's his own strangeness that's at fault. Rom grabs it by the trunk because he's confused for a few seconds as he's puzzled. The being makes no effort to save itself, but he understands it cannot. As Rom lifts the car in comic book form by the trunk, not by the bumper or the frame, just the trunk. No, no, it, it is impossible. Yes, by the laws of physics, it isn't. But this is comic books, folks. The danger has passed, yet she still he still senses fear in the being, fear of him. And, I mean, I loved this art as a kid. I mean, Brandy's like, oh, who are you? What do you want? Please, I don't want to be happening. The fear seems genuine. Perhaps the being is what it appears to be. But appearances can be deceiving. There's only one way he summons from subspace, the energy analyzer. No, don't hurt me, please. Somebody help. And he against the corona of the analyzer raid, the being stands revealed. She is woman, race called on this world homo sapiens. As her terror gives way to Wonderman, he knows that she is not the enemy. And Brandy's on her, on her, I'm a liar, my money, uh, it didn't do anything to me. Rom looks around, oh, sorry, time for an ad for hubba bubba. Come fighting, do's and don't. First thing to do, pick the right chew, the new Hubba Bubba, soft and chewy bubble gum with amazing no stick bubbles and proceed with this simple yet effective gunfight drill. And you're going to have to pick up your copy of ROM uh, to read the rest of it. Just remember your size is not important, except no substitutes. Soft, juicy, delicious, big bubbles, no trouble. Hubba Bubba. See, folks, you can advertise on this here podcast. We're good with it. ROM takes off leaving a terrified Brandy Clark away. Let's see. Rom lands in Claritin, the kind of place where nothing out of the ordinary happens until now. Rom standing in the square using his analyzer. Meanwhile, two, two shady guys. You can tell because they're frowning. It's him. How did they track us here? What does it matter now that he's found us? Rom flashes around. And as he does, we don't see the shadow form, which happens later on. We just see his analyzer will not harm them. It only functions to reveal the truth about us. There's nowhere for us to run, nowhere to hide. Rom summons his neutralizer. 
please, we beg of you, yeah, scream, yeah. And what they see, saints in heavens, he disintegrated them where they stood. Mike Pollins, Perry Skyke's dead. The robot's a killer. The object terror, the populace fr flees. Continued after second page following, which means, okay, here's one of those super ad things where all the little, you can get a high school diploma and a ring. You can get real foreign money for 10 cents. From Clint Comics in Kansas City, Missouri, over 10 years in service. You can play finger football. You can get a Marvel price list from Robert Bell. You know the drill. Oh, oh there's a comic convention in Chicago, September 19th to 30th. That yeah, never lasts. Next page is ABC's TV Fun. Let's see what was playing. The world's greatest super friends. Superman, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman. And they're showing the Wonder Twins. Next is the All Plastic Man Comedy Adventure Show. Meet Plastic Man and his friends, the Mighty Man and Yuck, the world's ugliest dog. Rickety Rocket and Fang, Fang Face and introducing Fang Puss. After that, next meet Spider Man, Spider Woman in her own brand new show. I didn't even realize she had a show. And next was Scooby and Scrappy-Doo, or as we call him, the Antichrist. Brings you all new surprises. <laughs> and don't forget to watch all new, all different, exciting ex escapades on ABC Weekend Special. All right, back to the story. He goes back, or Brandy shows up. The woman shall explain. And of course, she's an abstract terror. You're a murderer, monster, don't even help me. So meantime... The mayor is calling the governor who hangs up on him and laughs and says we don't, which is which is really weird because you'd think that in Marvel Universe, yeah, an alien tech, well, but why is this happening? Did that bumbling fool have any luck, Clara? Not a bit, Sheriff. They thought he'd tied one on, but we won't have any problems getting help. Hello, Central. Get me Washington. And these people are all frowning, so you can tell they're the bad guys. And of course, they get through the Pentagon red phone. This is Andrews, no need to identify yourself. Only we know how to use this exchange. Rom, here on Earth, you're sure? All right, give me the details. Rom, meanwhile, has taken Brandy out somewhere, out Sugar to Clarion, uses his translator, and now is able to speak with Brandy. And she's, why did you murder those poor people? Those neutralized were not humans. You're mad. I've known those two men for years. I went to high school with one of them, which tells you how long dire rates have been on Earth. Nonetheless, they only appeared to be human. They dwelled among your race. They are the enemy. They seek dire race. Listen, woman of Earth, and perhaps I understand. I will tell you. <clears throat> oh, by the way, continued after two pages. Next page. All new superhero rubber masks. Let's see. Spider-Man, Batman, Hulk, Red Skull. Only $3.99. Or get all four for $14.99. You can get a guest kiss makeup kit. How about an all-new Marvel stamp set? Or a Hulk power coin bank? Oh, I, I am going to uh, eBay that one while you're busy. So this is through Heroes World. We talked about that earlier. He, they were set up even then. Uh, following page, the best model comes from the best kits. MPC. This set of MPC wheels gets you this set of MPC wheels for free. So basically... You buy the kits, you get 20 of these gold tokens, you send them in, they'll send you a free model. Next page starts the Legends of the Space Knight. And I'm not going to go over it too much because you know how much I love detail because the next two pages, because, you know, continue after the third page following, we go to CBS's morning lineup. Let's see, Mighty Mouse, Heckle and Jekyll with new Mighty Mouse shows. And then the Bugs Bunny Roadrunner show. I'm, yeah, this is CBS. And then after that, the all-new Popeye Hour, which I remember hating because Popeye never hit anybody. <clears throat> now, the new Fat Albert show, which probably is left in the dust. After that at noon, Jason and the Star Command. After that, Superman and the Super... I'm sorry, Tarzan and the Super 7. You get half an hour Tarzan, half an hour of Batman, and the Freedom Force. After that is 30 minutes, which is kids' version of 60 minutes. And, of course, in the news, exciting reports up to the minute about your world and what's happening in it. The third page is, again, tons of little tiny ads, shop by mail, comic books for sale, 
comic back issues, coconut stamps, free one million cash, which was true because what it is is I believe they shredded it all up. Uh, let's see. The story goes on. Oh, another page. Here's where you get the you could subscribe to Marvel. Let's see what have they got? Amazing Spider-Man, Avengers, Captain America, Conan, Daredevils, Defenders, Doctor Strange, Fantastic Four, Galactica, which means mean Battlestar Galactica, Incredible Hulk, Iron Man, Marvel Tales, Marvel Team Up, Marvel Two and One, Man Thing, Master of Kung Fu, Micronauts, Power Man, Rom, Spectacular Spider-Man, Spider Woman, Spidey Super Stories, Star Wars. Thor, What If, which is 12 issues, and X-Men. Just send in, and remember, all titles are mailed flat. So they must have gotten people upset because you can always tell when there's a uh, subscription fold in it. That was actually at a sale over the weekend, and one of the local dealers, Mark Myrtle, was looking at a book, kind of feeling, and he goes, yeah, this was a subscription copy. It's got the fold down the middle because you can feel it. Let's see. Here we see at the tail end, all the Space Knights look like Rom, except their crosshatching goes different directions. And as we know later on in the series, it changes. And we see the shadowy form of the dire race falling into limbo. And when they fall into limbo, all we see are black charred figures. So even then they weren't defined. As As Ram is talking to Brandy, he starts to realize that his analyzer reveals the cyborg threat to his eyes alone. Perhaps that's why the humans fled in terror. To me, the enemy was clear, but to human eyes, it must have seemed that I, an alien monster, slain their neighbors, and all of a sudden, pow, 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 he's getting fired on. It's help, Ram. Somewhere by the authorities, you might have convinced me you're telling the truth. How can you convince the National Guard? He takes out the analyzer. He discovers, oh, sorry, two more pages. Let's see, put stars on your T-shirt. Cheryl Ladd, Suzanne Summers, Kiss Rock Group, Dallas Cowboy Cheerleaders. Underneath, for $1, you can get these from, you can get these from Whopper Candy, the real malted milk ball with crunch. So you send in all four for $2, only $1, and a Whopper's wrapper. Uh, I pass over the grid ad because I've talked about that. Next page, you can get your own personalized trading card in full color. Trading cards, you send uh, a picture in, you get some stats. You can set yourself up with baseball, soccer, football. Boy, that'd be fun to do today. What do you do? Eh, I'm a comic podcaster. Okay, they fire in on Rom. Absolutely no effect. Rom talking to these guys, why do you humans attack me when those who harm you both reside in your right? He basically destroys the tank. Uh, flamethrower, ineffective. Let's see. He basically doesn't hurt anybody. He just, because the, the actual dire race are hiding in the background because they're all so happy. We've tricked the humans into fighting our battle force, but they like the power to hurt Rom. We may have to intervene. The next two pages are the bulletin bullpen, which I mentioned earlier. The aforementioned Twinkie ad this month, Spider-Man meets Chun Jitsu <laughs> and defeats her with Hostess Greenfield Cupcakes. You get a big delight in every bite of Hostess Twinkies. Uh, let's see. So they pull out a gun, the, the bad guys, and you can tell they're bad guys because they're frowning. Thank you, Sal. Hey, I've never seen a gun like that before. Where do you? Shut up. He fires it. Rom is actually in pain. It can only be a dire wraith weapon. Wielded by a dire wraith in human disguise. That's a truth you will never live to reveal, Gladorian. Well, unfortunately, Rom gets his neutralizer, sends him to the... The uh, death is better than internal banishment. No! The robot's death ray disintegrated. Poor Carlson. Sound the retreat. We're up against more than we can handle. So as Brandy tries to grab the gun, three of the townspeople who are dry race stop her. Rom turns around, disintegrates those three. However, one of them gets away. This sector is cleansed by dire race, but my quest goes on. He takes off. The humans are befuddled. He's flying off. It's not because of anything we did. Brandy is 
equally befuddled, gone without a word of thanks, leaving me with my doubts. However, the one who escaped, the dour looking woman we saw earlier, yes, calls the Pentagon. I heard the reports. You know what must be done. She transforms into a bird, flies away. All our people must be warned that Ram has arrived on Earth, but my usefulness here in Clarington is at an end. And I'm kind of curious as to why, you know, you could go back and if Ram actually was published in Marvel, cover because they were obviously on Earth for a long time. What were their plans? Because obviously they want to take over. And I'm sure if we go back and reread the, uh, the, uh, uh, the legend of the space knight, you'll will explain why and what the dire race are doing. They would take over the planet, but they're doing it so stealthily. Not that we see that. They'd never revisit that storyline, would they? Anyways, <laughs> next month, by a love betrayed. Don't miss it. Finally, the last page is you you get a free film offer from Popsicle Sweepstakes. Send a big snapsicle free offer on all popsicle multi sticks. It's a sweepstakes you enter. Uh, the final page is the aforementioned Parker Brother ad I talked about. And the final back panel is the Lego Expert Builder series, which was really hot and popular there, where they you could actually build yourself a speed racer, a farm tractor, a crane, or in this case, they're pushing their uh, claw thing. And these were actually. I never got into these because by that time I was too old for my Legos, but they were really cool. And that's ROM number one. If that doesn't get you excited for the omnibus, well, I'm sorry. Maybe Corey, what do you have for a retro review? I have, well, I picked up the Sergeant Fury Epic Collection number one. How epic. I have not read most of these. So oh, fun. So I read Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos, issue one, the comic that took the place of the Hulk. <laughs> yep, the Hulk was canceled because of low sales, and Mark Goodman told him, hey, why don't you do a war comic, but do it like that Fantastic Four book? <laughs> <laughs> sure. So it says on the cover, think you've read war stories before? Mr. Wait till you see what's in store for you here. It's only the greatest. And it actually says on the cover, another big one from the talented team that brings you the Fantastic Four, seven against the Nazis. It is a story by Stan Lee, art by Jack Kirby, inking by Dick Ayers, lettering by Art Simak. So by this point, Marvel was giving credits to everybody except the colorist. That did not come until the 70s, I believe. As I read this story, there are a few things that really stand out for me. One, the splash page uh, has all seven characters in the middle of action. Then the next is a two page spread which introduces all of the characters. Uh, Sergeant Nick Fury, Robert Rebel Ralston, who's an ex-jockey from the blue grass country of Tennessee, Jonathan Jr. Juniper, fresh out of an Ivy League college, Corporal Dum Dum Dugan, a one-time circus strongman, who is Sergeant Fury's good right arm, Gabriel Jones, Gabe used to blow the sweetest trumpet the side of Carnegie Hall, Dino Minnelli, you might have seen him in the movies under another name, for this handsome swap bustler gave up a promising career as an actor to repay the country he loves for all it has given to him. And then Izzy Cohen, the scrappy tough master mechanic loves machinery the same way men love fame and fortune. So really it's just kind of a another team book. Everybody, it, it, it very much is like pulp storytelling in that this is a group of very broad caricatures that they can use for um, action sequences and so that everybody's got a specialty, everybody's from a different place in the US, so Stan can have them related via their accents. It starts in France where a French underground communicate, where um, some French underground agents are captured by the Nazis. 
And oh, let's see here. Word has just come down from the division. Happy Sam. Happy Sam, of course, is a scowling general who's in charge of Nick Fury's company. <laughs> All we have to do is rescue the leader of the French underground from deep inside Nazi-occupied France. It's impossible. That's why they picked your company, mister. The fate of D-Day is at stake. All right, Joe, I got the picture. I've got dozens of jobs like this, all in the, like this in the records, all listed under suicide. Then we are introduced to the Howling Commandos as they go through their training. The plot is very simple. Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commandos are dropped into occupied France to rescue the leader of the French underground. If you read this as an action adventure story and utterly disconnected from World War II, it is a fun romp. Stan, Stan is using a lot of his corny, uh, smart aleck humor. The characters are all broad stroke stereotypes. Kirby puts in some wonderful action and comedy through the story. It does not let up for a second. Every page has people running and fighting and guns and bombs and tanks be blown up. And a lot of people say that in the 80s, action movies were too much action, no, no story. Well, I gotta tell you, man, this first issue of Sergeant Fury and the Howling Commandos, there's no plot to get in the way of the story. <laughs> it is just straight out action sequences with smart remarks, bombs and guns go off, but nobody gets hurt. It really feels like an episode of the A-Team except a better written and with Kirby drawing it. Kirby and Ayers. Now, this was around the time of Fantastic Four, number 12, 13. Kirby's stuff over on the Fantastic Four still seemed really crude. And that was because of the inking of Chick Stone. Dick Ayers really understood how to, how to ink Kirby in this. And while it's not as polished as the inking of Joe Sinnott, it's damn close. This is really good. Dick Ayers had spent a long time drawing Western and war comics. And after Kirby left, he would draw Sergeant Fury. And he still would do Two Gun Kid and Rawhide Kid and those characters. The art and the story is utterly fantastic. The only problem is it treats everything about World War II as comedy. Uh, there's a sequence where the Howling Commandos are coming into Germany and they're supposed to parachute in. So what do they do? They're they're getting uh, shot at by German, sure, German planes. How do they save themselves? Well, they leap out of their, <laughs> they leap out of the plane, are firing machine guns at the German planes. Dum Dum Dugan is throwing grenades that blow up in front of the planes. Nothing about this is realistic in any way, shape, or form. By the way, when the German plane blows up, uh, Dum Dum has his fingers in his ears and looks like he's laying on a couch <laughs> because it's, you know, it's no big deal. I just, you know, blew up a plane. <laughs> it is fast paced. This. If you could get past the fact that there are guns being shot and nobody is injured. If you could get past the fact that planes and tanks and all this stuff are being blown up, and as they do, people are making snide, smart-ass remarks, it works as a story. For me, however, reading this 60 years removed, it really... I think we look at World War II very differently than they did in the 60s. World War II was still thought of as a great adventure in the 60s because that's how movies and TV shows and everything portrayed it. It was just a great adventure that everybody went on. And we now know that, no, that wasn't what World War II was. It was more like Slaughterhouse Five. The soldiers who came back were changed by what happened. The Nazis did some pretty horrific things. It was not. It wasn't a nonstop action laugh fest. 
So if you can take that out of your brain and set it aside, you'll enjoy the story. I enjoyed it for the Kirby art, for Stan's um, corny wisecracks, and just kind of was able to separate it. However, I think most modern readers aren't going to be able to do that anymore. So I give this a borrow. If you're a Kirby fan, it's a must buy. If you're a fan of the Stan Lee school of scripting and broad stereotypes, it's a buy. For everybody else, it's a borrow. Because it's an epic, you know, you could read all these stories on Marvel Unlimited. You could check this book out of the library. It's a fun read. Kirby's art is just blows me away. The, you know, the Fantastic Four was my was you know game changing. His work on Captain America was very action packed. But these early Sergeant Fury stories are just they do not let up for us for a breath. It's just pure action, start to finish. Joe, we now get to my favorite part of the show. Oh, is this where you explain to me if Elongated Man is still current in the DC universe? No, no, no. It's not where I try to figure out what happened to Rick Jones's wife, Marlo, and how all of a sudden she be, she got superpowers and then she lost them. And then she got into a relationship with uh, Moon, Moon Dragon and then that vanished. And, and, and then I got a headache. Uh. No, it's freaking a geeking. Joe, what are you freaking on? Oh, Facebook, why do you keep fucking up? You want to hear some of the things that's been going on? I, I, Corey, do you think if you called somebody a dick, you might get banned on Facebook? I, you probably, you wouldn't get banned, but you'd, well, you'd get the ban hammer and not be able to post for a while. Somebody did because they were talking about Dick Dear Jono. Oh. So, again, the Facebook algorithm is going crazy right now, at least at the groups I'm looking at. It could be just the comic groups, because what happens is if you're in a group and you get tagged once, all of a sudden it's like their algorithm monster just turns on you. The other one that I've been seeing is I'm getting into a lot of Facebook selling groups where guys are doing auctions. Where they start things cheap or they're selling stuff. I did one a while back, sold some of the books that I can't sell on eBay anymore and did okay at it. But as I, you know, and I don't buy a lot because a lot of these guys, they want, they ship priority, $10 shipping. It's like, well, I don't want to buy a book that's a buck. It's, it's a good deal. I have a buck. But if you add it for $10, $10 on it, it's not an $11 book. However, if I see things like a signed comic or if I see, yeah, he's got a lot of stuff I want. Some are claim sales. Some are, you know, it's like, I want 100 bucks for this. Poof, it's mine. Somebody sold their JLA Avenger, the new trade paperback. It might have been their first one for 100 bucks, which was a steal because that thing's going crazy on the eBay's. However, what's happening is in the interest of banning spam, people are finding where they used to list two, 300 books. Suddenly they get kicked off eBay in the middle of listing their auctions and they can't, or eBay, I'm sorry, Facebook. They're listing these auctions and then all of a sudden eBay I'm doing it again because I'm pissed at eBay. No. Facebook bans them. So now they can't finish the auctions. You can't get a hold of them. You can't, you know, you can still bid on it, but then you're like, wait a minute. I thought you were, li you, you were showing, you were going to show your entire run of X-Men and you only got halfway through it. The other one that kills, and this one makes me mad, very mad, if you're bidding. A lot of times you go down and you bid, okay, bid a buck, bid a buck, bid a buck, bid a buck. All of a sudden you find out, oh, you've been posting too much. We're banning you for 24 hours in the middle of an auction. Some people are saying the workaround is don't use the dollar sign. Another guy says what's happening, and this is more conspiratory, but it's probably right. Facebook doesn't want these uninhibited sales. They want you to tap into their marketplace. Yeah. Yeah. Because they get money for that. And then there's a whole, I, it goes even deeper as one guy says, there seems to be an extreme effort by government to abolish the underground economy. You know what I'm talking about. Corey, I just bought a book for you for 10 bucks. Oh, are you going to claim that on your income tax? No, 
You going to take sales tax out of it? No. You probably don't even remember what you paid for it, even if they did. But we've seen it on eBay. They lowered it. 600 bucks is the threshold. It used to be $20,000. They can't go after the big guys, you know, the firms that, like General Electric, or they're gone now, but they don't pay taxes. Ronald Reagan thought that was disgusting back when he was president. Big billionaires, they don't pay taxes. They, they don't earn from wages. So the government's deciding we're going to go out, we're going to make eBay. You got to report this to the IRS. IRS is like, ah, uh, we don't have the manpower to do this, which is why they postponed it. Facebook's getting in on the act too. So it's disgusting. It's I don't know. It's, you know, I'm like, I benefit from it because I'm selling constantly on eBay. The one thing that's nice is that eBay at least collects the sales tax for me and distributes it so I don't have to deal with it. The only other thing I'm freaking on, and I alluded to it earlier, I, I was out helping, I stopped over, helped Lisa as we're wading through uh, Big Mike's collection and, you know, just finding, oh man, I found some killer stuff. I'll, I'll talk about it when we get to the geeking. And on the way home, I thought I'm going to have some Dairy Queen because I'm hungry. And I took a bite out of it, and oh, my God, my mouth exploded in pain. And I'm like, oh, uh, my cap might be dying. Just super, super sensitive. I had to stop halfway home and get some ibuprofen. It didn't help. That night, I went into the emergency room because, the, well, actually, Friday, I went to work, and the pain didn't go away, I had a rotten night's sleep. I left early and then at my wife's insistence, she said, you should probably go into the ER room. I swear, and this is actually more of a, a geeking. If, if I go in one more time, Corey, I get a free trip to the ER because I've been in there oh, so good. many freaking times the last couple of years. Yeah, I know that feeling. I have a client <sighs> who every, t every time I work at his house on a Sunday, I've had to take him to the ER. So I worked on Saturday and I said, all right, I'm working on it. I work a, a Sunday shift next month. Promise me we won't go to the ER and I'm going to take you someplace cool. <laughs> that didn't happen. Well, no, it has, it, I haven't worked yet. Oh, but I okay. kind of told him, hey, you know, if we don't go to the ER, we could go someplace even cooler. <laughs> <laughs> I know you want to get out of the house, but I'm tired of that place. Tired of that. I did... Uh... I, the only thing that happened at the ER is, first of all, it was a three-hour wait. Poor doctors, nurses. Again, I go to Regents Hospital downtown St. Paul. Excellent, excellent people. First thing he did, he apologized. And I'm like, dude, I, I get it, you know. And the problem is that they're not dentists. So unless I've got like a swollen jaw or something, they really, there's not much I can do. And I said, listen, I just need something for the pain so I can try to sleep. I got a dental appointment. Not till Monday, because dentists actually get the weekend off, which I laughed. I, I told the one doctor who came in, I told her, I said, you know, you should have been a dentist. You could have had the weekends off. <laughs> he just laughed at that. And I think they appreciate that because it's a stressful late night job. The people that were coming and going, I just, uh, I, I don't even want to get into it. It's just sad. Anyways, the one thing that helped is they did give me an antibiotic. They couldn't tell if it was infected or not, but they said, if it is, the dentist will appreciate that. I, it was a rough fucking weekend. I, I think, Corey, you'll get into it in geeking, but you and, and Evelyn went to the Dreamhaven sale. I couldn't go. I was just in too much pain. Uh, Chris was worried because she, had, she was ready to go to Portland uh, on a on a work trip, and I was, you know, she did go. I finally just told her go. You know, nothing. You can't do anything. Unlike when you had your gallbladder, I can get to the dentist alone. I can leave the dentist. Uh, I started taking the painkiller. Nothing helped. Oh my god! When that pain hit, Corey, I I felt like somebody smacked me with a sledgehammer, and I. <laughs> Nothing got rid of it. Even the, the oxycodone they gave me to try to, it wasn't oxycodone, but it was that type of drug, didn't dull the pain. Nothing dulled the pain. I would floss. I would brush. I would, I took fireball and rinse. I took hydrogen peroxide and rinse. 
ice pack, heat packs, nothing helped. And I just, it stayed that way. Sunday, I took a, a sick day. I got Chris to the airport and then things finally calmed down. And I, just like everything, you think, oh, great, I'm going to go to Dennis and whatever it was went away. Had a bowl of cereal. As soon as that food hit that side of the mouth, I thought somebody stabbed me with a knitting needle. There's nothing like tooth pain. It's so debilitating. And you're talking to a guy who went six months with crippling hip pain, who I lasted another six months with rheumatoid arthritis that was undiagnosed. Ah, someone's got a tooth. You got a toothache. Yeah, whatever. Ha ha. No, this was killer pain. Fortunately, I was able to sleep. I had my last pill. I went into the dentist. They took x-rays or whatever. She found that the tooth was already flagged earlier that it might have problems. She went into it and she goes, oh dear. Normally, if you go into a healthy tooth, it bleeds. She went into that tooth, it was dead. The nerves inside were dead. The pressure was, the pain I was feeling was probably the other teeth reacting to it. She started a root canal and she didn't have enough time because a root canal takes about an hour. But she, what she did is she cleared out enough of the tooth so that it's not obsessing anymore. The, the Fortunately, I was on antibiotics so that it'll go down. Whatever infection will disappear. That keeps the pressure off the other teeth. In two weeks, I get to go in. So when we record this here podcast on January 6th, Corey, I will be recovered from the actual hour root canal and hour fitting of a cap. Because normally you do one and the other, and I'm like, you know what, let's just do the two hours and get it over with. So we got that going for us. Which, which is, is nice. nice. Yeah. Oh. <sighs> I'm sorry, I went on. I went way too long. I was like, yeah, I got a root canal. No, it sucked. Anyways, that's Joe's health. And since we're in the summertime where the heat's and it's nice out and we're reading outside, that's what we're going to cover, at least till the severe weather hits when we record during a tornado. Corey, what you freaking on? Uh, my office job just kind of clicked up a couple notches in busyness. And I don't know if it's because our company is so successful that they're getting new clients or more likely we've been getting emails every day saying, hey, do you have friends who need a job? Tell them to apply. <laughs> hey, that's funny. I got the same thing from TSA, usajobs.gov, by the way. I will not recommend people for my company for one reason and one reason alone. They do not hire the job that I have. They don't hire you directly. You have to go through a temp agency and then you're with the temp agency for at least six months before they hire you on. Which in this economy, that's a stupid way to hire people. Well, let's see. You could be a temp for six months and maybe we'll bring you on and give you benefits or our competitors for pe for uh, phone reps is offering people more pay and benefits on day one. Where are people going to go? Hmm, I wonder. Now, the group home is actually fully staffed, and they kind of only need me on weekends. So the downside is that I do not have a day completely off, except for every so often. But the upside is that as of the first week in June, I won't be working any evening shifts at all because they are full. And that means more podcasts, more articles for PW Insider, et cetera, et cetera. But it also means that I'll be working more on weekends in order to make up the money that's, that's you know. My schedule was calm for about a year and a half and now it's all up and crazy again. And the office job is once again asking for overtime. And I'm actually taking the overtime because, hey, I'm not getting as many hours at the group home and I'm working from home, so it's OK. It's not like I have to, you know, oh, after I'm done, I have to drive home. But it is kind of tiring when they're one of the clients that I work on. The people who call. Are angry. 
all the time because their company is in trouble. No, I will not mention what it is. They've had four rounds of layoffs in the last two years. Their, their um, reputation was so bad that they actually changed the name of their company because it had gotten to the point where if you looked up that company, you would get articles about how terrible they were before you got to the actual website for the company. <laughs> and the people who work there are the ones that are left and they don't know if they're gonna have a job soon and they're still laying people off. So when they call, they're not pleased. And when people call and they're not happy, well, you're a faceless representative for the company that's making them mad. What are you geeking on, Joe? Well, I'm freaking on the fact that PW Insider has a ad block that pops up and tells me that I'm using an ad block. And yep. I don't know what I'm using, so I can't undo it to see your article. <sighs> I guess you're going to have to read it on the uh, on the mobile app. I've, no, I don't download mobile apps just for that. No, I mean, you could read it on the um, on your phone via your web browser on your phone. Yeah, that's too bad because I, I usually I do support PW Insider, but if they're going to be dorks about it. Well, they have to make money off the ads, man. Dorks. If you're not going to subscribe. I subscribe for years. I barely watch pro wrestling, which is why I don't. And I don't mind clicking on the ads either, but I don't want your ads popping up constantly, especially since I have no freaking clue why they're blocked to begin with. I'll send it's you it's the not articles. it's not just that. Well, yeah, but it's part one. I mean, how many parts is there? Is every two? You, you said two, ten things. Well, I'm I'm getting on your geeking. I don't want to do that. <laughs> uh, the other freaking I'm on is that I did I couldn't find the Hulk uh, smash from Coin Bank on eBay, so I'm very very disappointed with that. Joe's had two freaking, two separate freaking sections. I have, I have, but I'm geeking. Uh, I, I actually a third, a third freaking. Ken Patera was up in North Branch on Sunday signing copies of his book, and I, I was real tempted to go, but I was real wary about my tooth. I almost wanted to call you, but I didn't know what your schedule was on Sunday if you were free to do it because I mean I'd be so cool to go first of all I love wrestling books and to buy it direct from him would have been cool I did make it however to the toy posse sale which was fortunately close by to the airport so on the way home I was able to hit it they're back at the American Legion so they have it part outdoors part indoors I ran into a guy d doing all of his books for a buck I don't know what I bought all I know is I spent a hundred bucks and I didn't spend too much elsewhere because I was so gamed at the stuff I bought from him and I'm, I'm just going through it. <sighs> Why can't I just quit that? <laughs> I mean, I had to stop. Everything's a buck because you got a Mark 10. Yeah, it's all a buck. Sounds like they were just blowing it out. I was so tempted to just make an offer on everything, but I, I didn't. I, I behaved myself. Speaking of behaving, uh, uh, if I can find the, uh, I had everything set up because I had, I was going to talk about, I finally finished a collection. I talked about, I think last podcast, Dell's Hogan's Heroes, nine issues. You remember I, the, the, the freaking geeking was that oh, issue number one looks a lot like issue number nine. They just reprinted it, which is something Dell Gold Key did a lot of. It must be, oh, we got that. Uh, just nobody's going to pay attention. Just send it out. Send it. So the poor guy I bought the number nine from, I canceled, said, sorry, sorry. And then I went back and I bought a, a fine copy of number two, but I got it. So now I have that run done. To be finished still, six million dollar man, Hot Wheels, whatever. So that was kind of fun. And I thought I'd mention a little bit about selling because I've sold some really fun stuff. And as my list, as yeah, eBay's been sitting there for a while. So speaking of books where they, the last issue was the same as the first issue, Yang number one from Carlton. What confused me again is it's the same book and you have to, I believe you had to go on the inside to see what it was. 
number one came out in 73. The last issue came out much later. So I did sell the number one because after reading it, oh, it wasn't good. Sold a My Little Pony, Friendships is Magic, that had art and a little blurb by Brian Milligan, one of the little pieces of original art. If you remember the Marvel Authentics that came out, is that? Yeah, that was during the 90s where they had places where the artists could write or draw. I know they did one for Magneto with Bart Sears, Spider-Woman. There were a few other ones as well. Been sell I finally sold my Immortal Hulk collection because people have been lowballing me on that for a while, but some guy finally made a palatable offer. Close to cover price, so I'm happy about it. Did the uh, Omnibus come out yet? For which one? Uh, Immortal Hulk. No. Okay, so it's still coming. I got to check to see if I ordered it because I don't remember if I did. A Gwar comic book, Orgasmageddon, <laughs> which was signed by all the Gwar members. That one's going off to, uh, I think, to Germany. But what I've been having a lot of fun selling are four-color comics. And what's real neat is when I sell one or when I get it and I, I try to figure out what it is, for example, the first one I sold was Bachelor Father, which was a TV show for one season back in 1962, I believe. John Forsythe was on the cover, which was kind of neat. Another one I sold, I'm not sure if I say this wrong, Chen, Chenin. It was, it was, uh, the Indian nation, and I, I'm really embarrassed I can't spell it right. Again, a TV show where every shot counts with a lone gun. Cheyenne, I think. Cheyenne? That could be it. C-H-E-Y-E-N-N-E. -E. Yeah, Cheyenne. Okay, thank you. Because I, I, Again, this was before, this is 1958 when this thing came out. Another one was one called, come on, eBay. eBay loves the ads, too. I got it up, and I'll send, boop, hey, let's put an ad in here. Thanks, eBay. Dactari, the wonderful world of Clarence the Cross-Eyed Lion and Judy the Chimp. Danger, action, fun. Marshall Thompson is a doctor for animals in Africa. This was a 1969 series. These are series I've never heard of, and it's kind of fun just to look it up and see if there was anybody in it. And, of course, a lot of these just lasted so short. I, it, I, I think I've asked this question before, but it's like, did Dell have, like, an open license just to publish these things, or did they pay the producer? Hey, we'll give you 10 bucks. We'll make a comic book of your series. Well... Why don't you head over to newsfromme.com because right now Mark Evanier is writing Border Crossing, which is a very long history of Western publishing. Because oh. remember, Dell, they didn't put comics together. Western Publishing put them together and Dell published them. And he talks about how a lot they made connections starting with Disney to all the movie studios and a lot of these the studios didn't charge them and would give them publicity stuff because they didn't see it as a way to make money they saw it as a way to promote a movie or promote a tv show and that's how a lot of these books through Dell got made because western had a studio in LA and no other comic pub book publisher did then they also had a um, studio slash office in New York. That's where you got the uh, the original series like Solar Man of the Atom, Magnus Robot Fighter, et cetera, et cetera. But over at newsfromme.com, Mark Evanier, he's up to part four on the history yeah. of Western. I found it. I'm going to have to read that when we get off. Because what attracted me to a lot of these is the fact they have photo covers. And a lot of the books that I have, Granted, the Hogan's Heroes I mentioned I got in great color. A lot of these I just found cheap because they're beat up. And if you sell them cheap, people are interested in it. And it's just amazing. All these series 
TV shows I've never heard of. And it's to me, it's a lot of fun. The only other thing I sold of note, I sold a copy of Extra Number Two. And you know what was interesting about it? Of course, Extra. Corey, you want to tell the fine folks what that title is? Is it that the EC book that took the place of shock suspense stories about a newsman? Mm-hmm. Yep. It did not last long. It was one of no. the new trend books. No, not new trend, new direction. What it was, you had the pre-trend, which were all the books before Tales from the Crypt. Tales from the Crypt and Weird Science and all those were the new trend. And then after they had to go away, they had the new direction. And all of those books faded by the sixth or seventh issue. Yeah, I actually had a copy I picked up for a buck somewhere. And after I read it, I just put it on eBay. Poor, fair. I sell these as great reading copies or placeholder books because, yeah, we all want a mint copy, but A, finding it's probably tough because, like Corey said, these didn't sell well to begin with, and now they demand extreme prices, assuming you can find one that hasn't been slabbed already. So, again, I've been selling a lot of Mike's stuff. I found some really amazing things that he had in his collection. I'm just trying to look through a few of them. Oh, there's a Magnus Fighter variant. There was a, a series of books that came out when I had the comic store called Marvel Collectible Classics. What Marvel did is they put a shiny chrome cover, chrome, around a reprint of an X-Men book. I think they did an Avengers and maybe a Spider-Man or two. Sold them for $13 to $20. Nobody wanted them. I, I, think, I, I think Gruber bought some. Mike had a full set, and believe me, they're going about 100 bucks now because, again, nobody buys it. It tends to go up. He had a couple Transformer Universe BotCon comics, some autograph books, and I opened up one of them mysterious envelopes I had. From, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, and it's La Murta Primeval. What do I have? Well, you got to go to my Ebays and find out. K-R-A-Y-Z, you know how to deal. So, oh, the other thing, of course, I did. I don't know if any of you follow me, Facebook Live. I had originally, when Corey and I were going to try to go to Dreamhaven, we were going to go to Burger King and have the Spider-Man Whopper and record our opinions of it. However, that plan got changed because our friend Evelyn came along, and I guess she's not a fast food connoisseur. Is that kind of what I'm getting? Yeah. Yeah, so... And then, of course, I had to bow out anyways because I couldn't do it. But I did manage to eat one. It's a Whopper. Does it, it taste did. like spiders? No, no. You're thinking the bubble yum we talked about earlier. Because I bubba? was really mad when Pop-Tarts had these spider berry Pop-Tarts. Oh. They did not taste like spiders. How do you know what a spider tastes like? You just sleep when they crawl in your mouth. I was a kid once. The other problem is... Unlike the horror burger, impossible, that black bun that came out that turned everybody's, you know what, weird colors, well, it, it didn't do anything. I was, I was at least hoping for red, but they're still out there. They're fun. I had it. I feel good. They're Marvel. I, I, I took care of one of your licensee. I've been, uh, Corey, what are you geeking on, other than not having to eat a Spider-Man Whopper? Well, I went to the Dreamhaven dollar book sale, and I will say this, they oversold it, because the way it was written, it's, we're going to be dragging books out of the basement, we're dragging books out of the garage, we've got this pod that's full of books. They had about eight tables set up with used books on them. So, while that's a lot of books, and a dollar each for used books, no matter what they are, was cool. I expected something much, much bigger. However, beforehand, I met up with the foster daughter, Evelyn. We went to Patisserie 46, which is a place I have heard about for years. It is a bakery. And oh my God, is the, <laughs> the croissants and the bread and everything. You know, this is a French bakery, so it's amazing. I've never had a croissant that good in my life. 
I could have just stayed there and eaten croissants all day and been a very happy man. Next time I'm in the Dreamhaven area or I'm in the Uptown area, I'm going to stop because the bread they have is so good. It's amazing. It's so good. Then we went over to Dreamhaven. They had about eight tables set up with paperbacks on it. And from what Greg said, it's just, you know, stuff they bought recently. They pulled out all the stuff that was collectible and everything else they just want to get rid of. And I was kind of sad they didn't have the garage open, but it was a nice day. So I dug through, picked out a whole bunch of books. I put a picture up on, on the Facebooks. I did not go totally nuts because I still have books from our last three geekings that are waiting to be <laughs> yeah. read. I got stuff from way back when, when the source did their dollar sale, I have yet to get into. But the main thing I looked for were short stories because I can read short stories anywhere. I can read them at the office job when it's a slow day. I can read them uh, at the group home when things are quiet because you can read a short story in about 15 to 20 minutes, maybe a half hour if it's a long one. So there are tons. And one of the things I find interesting back, starting in the 60s and into the 70s and it ended by the 80s, was there were a lot of people who put out kind of magazines as paperback books. Because what early paperbacks were was they just kind of took a pulp magazine and folded it over again to cut and then put a cover on it rather than anything else. They just, that's how paperback books were born. And then by the 50s, the pulp magazines were dead. Everybody was buying slicks, but there was still demand for short stories and especially genre stuff. So they would put out anthologies. And it's okay, we're putting out this anthology every quarter or twice a year or whatever. And you would have people like Michael Moorcock or Paul Anderson or in the case of Orbit, which I picked up, I think I got the first nine. No, I got the first 10. Damon Knight, it's okay. Well, we're putting out an anthology and yeah, you know, they have an introduction written by the editor, and then each short short story has a little blurb to tell you what the story is about and who the author is. And that's kind of I kind of knew about it, but I kind of didn't because by the time I was able to buy my own books, that had pretty much faded. They tried to bring Weird Tales back as a paperback anthology, and it didn't work. But it's why Harlan Ellison's Dangerous Visions was such a big deal because. He didn't just say, oh, I'm going to do it too. It's nope. I want, I want uh, the best stories possible. I want them change the genre. And it ballooned into this big thing. Many of the stories in the first and the second book won all sorts of awards uh, because it took science fiction from the pew pew rocket fighting to more idea based stuff, more psychological based stuff, more experimental stories. But I like a good anthology, especially ones where it's okay. Here's some good old fashioned pulp stories. They're not supposed to change your mind. They're not supposed to enlighten you. They're just supposed to entertain you because they, that was back when writer's job was to entertain the reader and that's it. So you can read them when you're done, put them in the grocery bag, I'm giving them to the library. Second thing I'm geeking on with my evenings off, I'm actually able to watch some movies and TV series and stuff like that that I have not seen. I'm also able to read more because when I'm at the group home, yes, most of the time it's kind of calm, but I don't watch TV for what I want, unlike many of the other staff. I watch what I know the clients want. Baseball. I was at the group home Saturday. They watch game shows and baseball all day. I had to get up and walk around every 15 minutes or I would fall asleep because both of them are so deathly boring, especially the stuff on the game show channel now. They don't rerun old game shows because those have all moved over to Buzzer. They have their own game shows where I swear to God, they spend 50 bucks on the set. And the prizes, you know, these are modern game shows. You won a hundred dollars as our grand prize. Woo! 
dude, <laughs> I would not spend an hour and a half getting made up, going through all the stuff, you know, whatever all you have to do to get onto a game show, win a hundred dollars and been excited about it. I would have said, you know, if I would have went to work, I would have made twice this. But that's just me. But I've had more spare time, which, as you've seen, you're getting a few more interviews out of me. You're getting some articles over on PW Insider. Maybe some old podcasts are coming back because I've got time around the house. And God knows I can't let anything just kind of sit. Uh, Comic-wise, I will be doing some extra reviews in the next month or so because I've got all these new comics that are uh, that we've been picking up all over the place, and now I've got time to read them. Woo-hoo. Believe it or not, kids, you've listened to us blather on about funny books for how long now? An hour and a half. Woo-hoo. And as we say every week, the comic we like the least, we still like better than the comic that you uh, like the most. Joe? She said caught me. I don't even have a... Uh, well, you know, if Marvel does do a new rom comic, I know who should write it. Who's that? Ram V. That way we get Ram and Rom. So we've got both kinds of memory. I, I don't think I want to talk to you anymore. Fine. Hit my music.